This week, we examine the power and influence of the Catholic Church in Europe and the part it has to play in the dramatic events before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Matt Davies joining you. It was announced last Sunday, Sunday the 21st of September 2014, that Pope Francis will be addressing the European Parliament on November the 25th of this year. The following is from an article on the Catholic News Service. Quote, in visiting the Parliament, the Pope will be accepting an invitation made by Schultz during a visit to the Vatican in October 2013. Quote, the decision to come to Strasbourg before visiting any individual EU member state as such gives a strong signal that the Pope supports and encourages the pursuit of European integration and unity, end quote, said a statement by German Cardinal Reinhard Marx of Munich and Frasing, President of the European Commission of Bishops. Quote, we hope that the Holy Father will encourage European parliamentarians in their work and that he will indicate how the fundamental values of the Union, inspired to a large degree by the Christian faith, may shape the Europe of tomorrow. End quote. Consider the power the Pope has here. No other religious leader can address political leaders in this way, and it is significant to remember that many of the European politicians subscribe to the Catholic religion. Now, the Catholic Church has long been behind the gradual unification of Europe in its dream to help re-establish the Holy Roman Empire of old, where it enjoyed a high level of authority and power. It has strived to revive this since it was stripped of its power in the 1800s. It was back in 1975 when addressing the bishops of Rome that the then Pope, Pope John Paul IV, clearly stated, quote, Can it not be said that it is faith, the Christian faith, the Catholic faith, that made Europe? It is there that our mission as bishops of Europe takes a gripping perspective. No other human force in Europe can render the service that is confided to us, promoters of the faith, to reawaken Europe's Christian soul where its unity is rooted. End quote. This sentiment was echoed by John Paul II's successor, Pope Benedict, who quoted the re and reinforced this statement in a speech held on the 24th of July 20, uh, 2005. And then earlier this year, on the 27th of May, whilst addressing Italian workers, this same papal terminology was again regurgitated by the current Pope, Pope Francis. Quote, what can we say when faced with the very serious problem of unemployment that affects various European countries? This great challenge requires the involvement of the Christian community as a whole. The first challenge is to revive the roots of faith and of our adhesion to Jesus Christ. End quote. The Catholic Church has long been campaigning for the unification of Europe. This mission is well underway as we have seen in recent years the gradual unification of European power. From the outside, it might seem that this has been done purely on a political basis, but it is clear when one looks at the facts that the European Union is steered, is steered slowly but surely by its religious backbone. The Catholic Church, who behind the scenes is guiding the European Union for its own interests. Now, this is exactly what we would expect to see as we near the end of Gentile times. In the Bible, we often have prophecies which are proclaimed in symbol. It is so that only those who put the time and effort into understanding them will be able to decipher their meaning. One of these symbols is a symbol of beasts. In Daniel 7, we have recorded four such beasts. In verse 4, we read of a lion, verse 5, a bear, verse 6, a leopard, and in verses 7 and 8, a dreadful and terrible fourth beast. We read in verse 17 of Daniel 7 the interpretation of what these symbols mean. 
quote, these great beasts which are for are four kings or kingships or kingdoms which shall arise out of the earth, end quote. These four kingdoms then relate to a previous chapter about the kingdom of men in Daniel chapter 2. They represent the kingdom of Babylon as the lion, the kingdom of Medo-Persia in the bear, the kingdom of Greece in the leopard, and the kingdom of Rome in the fourth beast. It is this fourth kingdom which stays on the earth in different guises from the times of the original Roman Empire, right up past our day until it is removed by the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. And this is spoken of in Daniel 7 verse 13, quote, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came from the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. End quote. This person termed one like the son of man also has a host of people with him called saints or called out ones. We read that they are instrumental in taking away the kingdom from the beast in verse 17 and 18 quote these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth but the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever even forever and ever end quote it is interesting to note that associated with this fourth beast are ten horn powers in verse 7 and one of these horn powers is picked out in the prophecy and we're given a few more details about it. It is a religious power. We read this in verses 20 to 22. And of the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld. And the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. The beast, then, represents a system or power which exists down through time until Christ returns. Daniel 7 is an overview of this system, but later in the prophecy of Revelation, we are given further details. In Revelation... We find that this great and terrible fourth beast actually goes through various phases. In Revelation chapter 12, we read in verse 13, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. We have here then a connection with that beast-like animal, the dragon, which has ten horns. But this system develops. In chapter 13, we read of two further phases. For example, in chapter 13 and at verse 1, we read, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power and his seat and great authority. We see then how this is the same system, but just a different phase. In verse 11, we read of an earth beast, which exercises the same power as the previous sea beast. Again, another phase in its development. Now, sadly, time does not permit a full historical exposition of these various phases. But as an overview, the dragon phase is speaking about the pagan Roman Empire. The sea beast phase is all about the Christian Roman Empire. And then the earth beast phase is a prophecy of the time of the Holy Roman Empire. What is fascinating, though, in the light of recent news is the final depiction in Revelation of this beast. The details are extraordinary when we consider world events. 
Now this final phase is given to us in chapter 17, where we read this in verses 3 to 6. So he carried me away in the spirit into, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet coloured beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So we have here the connecting characteristic of the ten horns showing us this is the same sister. And sitting on this beast is a woman who applies herself as a whore. And in the scriptures, a woman represents a community of people. See Ephesians 5, 23, John 16, 21 and 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. A whore denotes an unfaithful community, a people who have gone astray from the things of God. See Hosea 1 verse 2, Jeremiah 3 verse 8 and James 4 verse 4. Now this woman is closely related to Babylon. And this takes us back to Genesis 11 and the place where false worship began, Babel. This religious system is riding the beast, the political empire. It is steering the territories of the Roman Empire of old. We read this system which runs the beast is the mother of all harlots, a mother of many apostasies. In verse 6, she is known for her persecution of the true saints. She is a community known for ruthless opposition to the truth of the Bible. By the way, this links, doesn't it, with Daniel chapter 7 and verse 26, with the blasphemous little horn, which speaks great things and persecutes God's true saints. Now in verse 8, we read that this final beast system revives from being almost forgotten on the world stage. In verse 8 we read, The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. This beast system then was somehow around before. Then it almost disappeared because it was not, and yet, at the time just before Christ returns, it revives and is on the earth alive and well. The final aspect of what we want to consider is what is recorded in verses 12 to 14 of this 17th chapter of Revelation. We read there, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So we can be sure then that this is the final phase of the beast system because it is this phase which Christ, the lamb and those saints which are with him, will remove. This is the same prophecy as Daniel chapter 7, just with more detail. We see from these verses that on this final phase, ten horns appear to be ten notable kings or dynasties or powers which are on the territories of the beast. And these all pull their resources and powers to receive a kingdom with the beast. So to summarise our expectations then, simply by good Bible reading, just before Christ returns, we should see a force in the world, a political system, the beast, which will revive and be based on the old Roman Empire system. We would expect to see nations giving their economic, military and sovereign control to it and uniting together. We would expect to see a religious woman community which will heavily influence its politics. This is exactly what we see when we consider Europe today. The Pope 
is calling for this unification. He is making ready to address all the political leaders of Europe on the 25th of November this year. You can be sure he will use this to instill Catholic Church dogma into the leaders who mostly subscribe to his church. We will see him guiding Europe as a woman riding a beast. And as time goes on, more and more calls for integration are being echoed around the media. For example, The Telegraph on the 22nd of June this year had an article entitled Italy to push for United States of Europe when it hosts the EU presidency. The nations are beginning to give their power to the beast. The woman community is ready to take her seat. The question is, are we ready? Whose side will we be on in the climax of the dramatic event soon to take place when they make war with the land? There can only be one victor. Back in Daniel 7 we read, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Let us therefore strive to follow the gospel of Jesus Christ in the time that remains. Let us live as the people of the saints, having taken on the saving name of Christ in baptism and in striving together for the faith of the gospel. Join us again next week, God willing, for another Bible in the New World.